Good evening and welcome to LMU. My name is Christina Bogdano and I am the director of the Calogera Center for Modern Greek Studies. On behalf of the center, the Theological Studies Department and the Huffington Ecumenical Institute at LMU, I would like to welcome you all to today's panel discussion on the conversion of Hagia Sophia. As you know, Hagia Sophia was converted into a working mosque this past July after almost 90 years of its status as a museum. An act many call a populist move by the Turkish President Erdogan, it has met by a chorus of dismay from both religious and political leaders around the world, as well as from Turkish secular democratic groups that oppose him and his government. Declared a museum in 1934, Hagia Sophia has stood as a symbol of Ottoman secularism, multiculturalism, tolerance and reconciliation with the West and Christianity. It has stood as a gesture that the modern Turkish Republic did not define itself on the basis of conquest narratives of Islamic victory over the Christian world. Our panelists today will explore the broader implications of the conversion of Hagia Sophia, one of the most significant world heritage monuments in Christianity, and what this means for future interfaith dialogue. Father Thomas Rouse, the Emeritus T. Mary Tilton Professor of Catholic Theology, an acting director of the Huffington Ecumenical Institute at LMU will be our moderator. Father Rouse, a specialist in the areas of Christology, ecclesiology, and ecumenism, has published 24 books and authored over 300 articles and reviews. He has lectured internationally and his work has been translated in nine languages. He is currently co chair of the Los Angeles Catholic Evangelical Committee and co-chair of the Theological Commission of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Father Rouse will introduce our panelists. And thank you very much, Christina. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, this distinguished group of scholars uh, that Christina has brought together for our uh, conversation this evening. Uh, I'm gonna introduce them and then propose a couple questions and then invite as of their expertise, their, their particular competence and so forth. Uh, and then uh, I'll let them interact with each other for a little bit. So I think that's the way we'd like to proceed tonight. So let me start by uh, introducing these panelists. First is Archimandrite Cyril Hoverum, who is a graduate of the Theological Academy in Kiev uh, and a national, at the U national University in Athens. He did his doctoral studies at Durham University in uh, Great Britain under the supervision of Father Andrew Luth. He was the chairman of the Department of External Church Relations of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. He's a priest of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church <clears throat> and also the deputy chairman of the Educational Committee of the Russian Orthodox Church. So he has a, a difficult relationship between the two, which is quite interesting today. In 2017 to 2020, he was the acting director of the Huntington Ecumenical Institute here at Loyola Marymount and also an associate professor, assistant professor. Uh, Father Dorian Llewellyn uh, is the only Welsh Jesuit in the world today. He is the uh, new president of the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies at USC. From 2003 to 2016, he taught theological studies here at Loyola Marymount, uh, where he also directed the Huntington Ecumenical Institute and the Catholic Studies Program. He has an extensive background in ecumenism and interreligious dialogue and currently heads the task force of the International Association of Jesuit Universities on Secularization and Religious Diversity. Professor Maria Mavrudi is Professor of History and Classics at UC Berkeley, specializing in the field of Byzantine studies. She received her PhD from Harvard in Byzantine studies and her bachelor's from the University of Thessaloniki in, in philology. Her primary research interests are in Byzantium and the Arabs, Byzantine intellectual history, and the ancient tradition between Byzantium and Islam. She is one of the leading scholars in Byzantine Greek history and received the MacArthur Fellowship from 2004 to 2009. Professor Becerra Pancheva is a professor of art history at Stanford University. <clears throat> She's published three books, <clears throat> excuse me, three books with Pennsylvania State University, each of which has won awards. <clears throat> uh, 
and she has edited the volumes Oral Architecture, an Icon of Sound, Architecture, Music, and Imagination in Medieval Art. Her work is informed by phenomenology, placing the attention on the changing appearances of objects and architectural space. And to do this, she relies both on film and often candlelight uh, and, and sound. Uh, our final panelist tonight is Professor Ali Jekloglu, who is an associate professor of Ottoman and Turkish history at Stanford University. His research centers on economic, political, and legal institutions and practices, as well as social and cultural life in Southeastern Europe and the Middle East during the Ottoman Empire. He is the author of Partners of the Empire, Crisis of the Ottoman Order in the Age of Revolution. So those are our uh, panelists this evening. I think it's a very, uh, <coughs> very interesting and, and very distinguished group. Let me just suggest uh, several questions. Uh, we don't have to answer each of these in order, uh, but they might give you um, points that you would like to address. And then we'll start from the beginning with uh, Father Hoverum, and I'll allow each of you five or six minutes to uh, address any particular interests uh, that you have in this particular question, any particular insight. So these, these are the questions we suggest. Why did the Turkish government introduce the mosque museum issue at this particular time. Why now? Why now? Secondly, what are the broader political implications, the tactical motivations and ideological orientations of this movement? Thirdly, what from your perspective, from your uh, special uh, interest and competence in this area, are the different challenges of converting the Hagia Sophia, an important site for both Islam and Orthodox Christianity, into a mosque? Uh, what, what are the implications of this? Uh, what are the challenges that this issue raises? And, and finally, what role might ecumenical and interfaith dialogue play in the aftermath of this decision? What, what, how might uh, this uh, Im impact ecumenical and interreligious dialogue? Which of course is so important today with so much of religion, religious-based violence. Huh? That's one of the real problems we deal with today. So we'll start with uh, Father Hoverum uh, to, to uh, give his own perspective on this, to take a few minutes, five or ten, five minutes, six minutes, uh, to address this in any way you want. Thank you, Father Tom. I'm very happy to see you all. Um, uh, and um, thank you for inviting me to discuss this important topic, indeed. Uh, well, uh, I will probably say some th uh, things that uh, will be repeated by other speakers. Um, and uh, my first take on this is that certainly it is, it is very clear that this was an act of uh, political populism, um, which has a little to do with religion per se, on behalf of, <coughs> of um, uh, Recep Erdogan. Um, it has far-reaching consequences, political, both political and, and religious. <coughs> internally and externally for Turkey. Um, among uh, such consequences are those that we've uh, witnessed just recently, like if you take the um, war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which started a few days ago, as you know, with uh, quite a lot of casualties so far now, uh, it is certainly a projection of the external policies of Mr. Erdogan, uh, because Armenia has for instance, has accused uh, Turkey for supporting backing uh, the efforts of Azerbaijan, and already the Turkish officials have supported uh, the Azerbaijani uh, assault against Armenia. So this is really, and it's an old conflict, but unfortunately it, it has been reignited now, and it is connected somehow with, uh, uh, with the general policies uh, of uh, the Turkish government and certainly uh, the conversion of Hagia Sophia and uh, Kariya Jami, or also known as Hora Monastery, uh, they are connected. They are events, even though they are not connected 
directly, they are the events in the same series of, of policies. Um, or if you take another um, political aspect, like for instance, the uh, enhancement or more uh, visible, more uh, even aggressive policies of Turkey in South, in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, which has affected Cyprus, for instance, and Cyprus, <coughs> This turn, for instance, blocked the, the EU sanctions against uh, Belarus, against Lukashenko, Mr. Lukashenko, who usurped power essentially in, in Belarus. You see how, uh, how the policies in a particular corner of the world in Turkey has reached as far as Eastern Europe and has affected you know, the developments in, in the countries like Belarus. Uh, so it's really... Um, a policy, this populist policy that has very far reaching consequences, both political and religious. <clears throat> I believe that, um, I, I believe that uh, it does harm to a lot of religious institutions, primarily the ecumenical patriarchate, because Hagia Sophia, I should remind uh, our listeners, it used to be the cathedral, the main church of the ecumenical patriarchate in the uh, Roman Empire, well, which we misleadingly call Byzantium because Byzantium never existed. Uh, there was always the Roman Empire, uh, which spoke Greek mostly uh, for approximately 1,000 years. And Hagia Sophia was the main church of that Roman Empire. And moreover, it was the most magnificent church uh, in the world for, for centuries, uh, the largest building uh, in, the, in, in the entire world. So it, it has a very important symbolic meaning for the ecumenical patriarchate, for the entire orthodoxy, for the Greek people. Um, and uh, it is kind of a major, uh, a major uh, well, insult to them. But I, I also think that it doesn't do good to, uh, to Islam. Uh, maybe I'm overstretching, but my impression is that Mr. Erdogan, through his populist steps, does the same good to Islam as Mr. Trump does to Christianity uh, with his policies. So that is, uh, for me, it is a very clear parallel here. Uh, so I think Islam is insulted in the same way as, um, as orthodoxy in a similar way. And we can judge this from the reactions from the Arab world. And we already heard uh, negative uh, statements and reactions from the Arabic countries, which are afraid of, you know, of the ri rise of the Ottoman Empire with which they had difficult relations, complicated relations in the past. And they, they're afraid that old uh, rivalry, the old kind of quarrels, they come back, uh, which is not helpful indeed. Um, and finally, what I wanted to point out is the ecumenical dimension of this. Um, um, uh, some ecumenical bodies have expressed their concerns together with the church, churches and religious organizations. Um, I just want to uh, mention one statement uh, promulgated by the World Council of Churches. It was promulgated on the 24th of July this year. <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's a short statement, so allow, allow me to read it. Uh, it will take only one minute. So it says, today... It's 24th of July. Today, despite the appeals of Christian leaders around the world and many members of the international community, including a number of prominent Muslim leaders, the decision to reconvert the Hagia Sophia from a museum to a mosque was implemented with Muslim Friday prayers being heard in the ancient building uh, for the first time since the 1930s. In this afternoon's concluding session, of this week's meeting of the World Council of Churches Executive Committee members representing different church families and regions joined in prayer and sorrow with millions of Christians around the world, marking this sad day in history of Christianity and of interreligious relations. They express their solidarity with all those churches that are marking this day by the ringing of church bells as a sign of mourning. Uh, we also offer our solidarity and um, accompaniment, uh, uh, and accompaniment, particularly to all churches and Christians of the Orthodox family, for whom Hagia Sophia holds a very special significance, as well as to all Turkish citizens who do not feel re represented in this action of their government. 
We continue to pray that the Turkish authorities will be moved to reconsider this decision and to, do, and to undo this deeply regressive measure. You know, the World Council of Churches is usually very diplomatic in, in its statements. And this statement is quite uh, clear on, on the issue. So that's, uh, I think, uh, the ecumenical voice, if you want, uh, regarding these events. We see how uh, really from the different religious backgrounds, uh, there are reactions which are rather negative uh, to, um, to, uh, to these actions of the Turkish government. Uh, and uh, the last personal touch. We are talking always about, usually about Hagia Sophia, but as I mentioned in the beginning, another monastery, ancient monastery, was converted to a mosque as well, uh, the Hora Monastery, which is known also as used to be uh, Kariya Jami, a Kariya uh, Mosque, uh, which just like Hagia Sophia uh, became a museum. Well, my personal kind of uh, preferences, to be honest, is uh, they lay with uh, Kariya Jami. It also has magnificent, you know, uh, mosaics and, and frescoes. And unlike the, the grand um, uh, mosaics of Hagia Sophia, the ones in, in, in the Hora, they're so, they're much more in, uh, kind of intimate, uh, much more humane, much more touching, and I will really miss them. So uh, we will turn now to Father Dorian. Thanks. Um, I'm going to read out what I've got, Tom. So I think when it's when it's time, just switch off my mic. And be, okay. Um, so um, this is a site in which intra-Christian and Christian-Muslim concerns are invested. They're cl clearly intertwined over millennia. Um, but we might say that you know there are other sites where there uh, are, I guess, analogous histories. I'm thinking particularly of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which has many claims on it as well. And then, of course, as we've heard actually from Father Cyril, then there are deep-rooted, visceral convictions about the na about the nature of nation, nation, state, and religion, the, the relationship between Western culture and non-European cultures. And I think particularly on the claims of the past on the present. Um, you know, in the history of religion, sacred sites often change allegiance. Um, in the ancient world, and victory of one army over another was also a victory of one god over another. And inevitably, shrines changed dedicatees. Um, and in these cases, the changes were religious, political, symbolic, practical, economic, and often very painful. Uh, in the history of Christianity, uh, the decline of Roman religion and the growth of Christianity meant that... Um, there were suddenly a lot of buildings available to become churches. So as an example, San Clemente in Rome is a 12th century church. It's built on a 4th century church, which was converted out of the house of a nobleman. In the basement um, is a, was a temple, uh, a Mithraeum, dedicated to the, doc, to the god Mithraeus. So there are multiple layers of sim, uh, in that meaning, but I think in a site such as, of, of San, as uh, Hagia Sophia, there are many layers there as well. Now in the history of Christianity, Christian, the Christian church also propagated this strategy of appropriating other religions' sacred sites. Um, thinking about St. Gregory the Great, who sent St. Augustine of Canterbury to England and said, uh, you should by no means destroy the temples of their gods, but rather the idols within those temples after you purify them with holy water. If the temples are well built, they should be converted from the worship of demons to the service of the true God. Thus, when the people see that their places of worship have not been destroyed, they will come to places which are familiar and dear to them as they now acknowledge and worship the true God. So I think psychologically what Gregory understood was the nature of sacred space, which is that it often carries many emotional uh, memories over the worship of, worship of previous generations. Now, religions come and religions go, and sometimes they come back again. Um, so what I want to say is that the conversion of Hagia Sophia into a mosque following the fall of Constantinople 567 years ago was actually an ancient strategy which has been pr pr practiced by both Muslims and Christians within their own religions, as well as on the sacred places of other religions. Um, so as an example of the Umayyad, mosque in Damascus was built in the 17th, 7th century following the Muslim conquest of Damascus. It was built on the site of a Christian basilica of St. John the Baptist. 
And on the other hand, we get in Spain, the Cathedral of Cordoba in Spain is La Mezquita, which is a building uh, which has a re Renaissance nave planted right in the middle of an eighth century Umayyad mosque, which itself was built on a sixth or seventh century church. Now in Spain, there are calls for Muslims to be allowed to pray in La Mezquita or for it to be secularized by the state. But it is a living, active cathedral of an actual diocese which functions. So these have not been successful. And that perhaps might be influential in the case of Hagia Sophia, is that the community which it represents, from which the Christian community, which it is symbolic, is not physically there in large numbers. You know? It has a huge symbolic value. So, um, so in a way, what we might say, we think of, of um, hey, sexy. Uh, we may think of the, um, the conversion, this Hagia Sophia is a conversion now of a, what was a specular space with previous religi religious ownership back into the religious domain. The conversion from secular space into sacred space is really pretty unusual. Uh, it happened and it takes on a particular color with the French Revolution. So the Cathedral of Notre Dame was briefly a temple to, uh, to reason. And the conversion of sacred places to purely secular use, to be cultural sites, is a process we call museumification. Uh, it means uh, marking out certain buildings or areas as monuments of history and often national history. So as such, what I'd like to say is that the recent conversion of the, um, so the, 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 the 1934 conversion of Hagia Sophia Mosque into museum was a triumph of the secular present over the religious past. But what has happened now with the reconversion is the triumph of religion or popularism or religious popularism uh, into uh, is the triumph over the enlightenment doctrine of progress as well as of multi multiculturalism. So it's another deplacement. Now, to move on just on to the, the religious aspect here, the, the interreligious one, it's not at all clear to me whether the Turkish government made any sort of consultation. Um, clearly, the sites of the, the, and dates chosen for this reconversion are highly symbolic po uh, politically. It's 567 years since the conquest of, of, of uh, Muslim conquest of, of Constantinople. But had the government decided to consult, it would have been very difficult to know who exactly to consult with, which this points to a, a major feature in uh, both intra-Christian and, in, and Christian-Muslim relations. There are significant diversities, as Father Cyril has pointed out, significant diversities of beliefs and opinions within each religious group. There is no united Christian voice. Uh, Patriarch Bartholomew, the World Council of Churches, protested the de decision. And Pope Francis said he was pained, but there was no sign of the Vatican intervention which had been hoped for. Now, the, the Vatican watchers debate whether that was a missed ecumenical opportunity or, in fact, inter-religious inter restraint. 70% of Turks, I have read, approved of his conversion, according to one poll. But the fact that Justinian's great church, symbol of the Christian Roman Empire, is now once again a mosque, what does that actually mean on the ground for ecumenical and Christian relations? And behind that is another question. How really important is this decision in a world where many other things call for urgent attention? So it's a question of proportion. Now, personally, as you can tell by the icons behind me, it's very important to me, but a need for stronger, intra-Christian relations, that is stronger, more practical concerns. We do have good relations, but our symbolic relations look suspiciously merely symbolic. And again, for intra-religious uh, relations, again, we have many good local attempts at bridge building, but these function mostly in specialist and local grassroots arena. It functioned for a period as a dual mosque and church. So under Muslim rule in medieval, in what is today Spain, at certain times and places, one building could be used as a mosque on a Friday, a synagogue on a Saturday, and a church on Sunday. This is a practical con expression of what is called con conviviencia. Now, it is certainly possible to romanticize that period, 
Uh, it was a period of social and religious toleration, but the ideal is a good one to aim for. The Turkish Council of State has, de has decreed that the building will be used only as a mosque. This is a decision that I hope can change under a different regime because there is indeed historical precedent for what we now call multi-faith spaces. Uh, what I'm going to say, I think in ecumenical and um, ecumenical and uh, interreligious things, what often works is to think globally, to act locally. Communication, communion and concern on shared concerns. So what can we do? Practically, we can live out interreligions better in our, daily, uh, uh, in our daily life. We build the relationships first, we do things together, and then things will, um, will then on that basis of trust, it will be possible to talk about such things that has happened with this, uh, with this reconversion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Father Dorian. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Maria Mayrudi from uh, UC Berkeley, Professor of History and Classics. Maria. I'm new. All right. I think I can be heard now. Uh, so let me try and take the questions from the beginning. Uh, why now? Uh, in my personal opinion, this was coming for a very long time. Erdogan, as a young man, had participated in um, uh, demonstrations already in the 70s uh, in order to reconvert Hagia Sophia from a, a museum to a mosque. And every time there was a rise in Islamism, this, this uh, was on the table. I thought it was gonna come and I thought he was saving it for a moment where it would be the most opportune for the populist politics Erdogan is pursuing. And I think this was the right moment because he's had too many defeats. COVID has not been addressed very well in Turkey. The economy is really bad. And recently, he lost Istanbul in the municipal elections. So he had to reassert the fact that he's the boss, and it had to be done with a grand gesture that did not cost much. So it was the right moment. And uh, he had been saving it because you can see this escalation of conversions that uh, Father Cyril mentioned earlier. Uh, there was uh, uh, Hagia Sophia in Iznik, Nicaea, the site of the First Ecumenical Council, has been made into a mosque uh, a few years back. Trebizond, this is also a very important city uh, because it was a, a different empire that was conquered in 1462 and it was conquered by treaty, Sulhan. It was not conquered by force, so it could, be, it could not be plundered. And uh, this, uh, this um, uh, I, I don't want to become the full Byzantinist and analyze this, so I'll skip that analysis, but it's very important within the Ottoman understanding, and it was a Hagia Sophia, and it was a, an imperial church, so converted into a mosque again. And uh, uh, Hora, that Father Cyril mentioned, is uh, the other conversion. So this is the fourth by my count, and I may be missing some. And um, I think part of the gesture is uh, to send to everybody uh, who's paying attention the message that this is a reversal, of the secular Turkey that is Kemal Ataturk's legacy. That's what's riding on this and nothing else. Uh, of course, it's with, perfectly within his right to do this. I don't think he was interested in consulting with anyone. I don't think he's interested in dialogue. The point is to show he's a boss. And the symbolism of Hagia Sophia is very potent. Uh, within the Quran, as a Byzantinist or a byzantino arabist the thing that's very interesting for me in this whole affair is how patterns that uh, come from the 7th century, the period of the early Muslim conquests, that were then recycled in the 15th century during the uh, conquests of Mehmet the Conqueror, are now being recycled yet again by Erdogan in this new context. And uh, I think part of the message he wants to send to everyone, including the Arab world, is that he antagonizes the, the kind of weakened Arab leadership as the biggest boss, the biggest protector of Sunni Islam. So like they are protectors of uh, sacred sites, uh, Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, they are and they are not, I mean, it's a problem. Uh, he's the protector of a major holy site, which is, which is Hagia Sophia. And this has a Quranic um, significance to it. Uh, because among the Quranic chapters is one which is the chapter of the Byzantines. 
and there it promises uh, the, the conquest of Constantinople by the Arabs, uh, that, uh, or the Muslims, I should say, and uh, that almost happened in the 8th century. Uh, it happened in 1453. Uh, it was uh, prominently uh, displayed in the rhetoric of 1453 at the time, and this is what is being recycled now. It is the rhetoric of 1453 that goes back to uh, the Quran in an apocalyptic, in a kind of eschatological way. So this, uh, this is the symbolism that he recycles, and it's a very potent one. And um, uh, for me, as a Byzantinist, uh, the question is, um, I mean, who is the biggest victim of this? I think it is the secular-oriented uh, people in Turkey uh, who may or may not be believing Muslims, but they certainly do not want a, a kind of Muslim-oriented state. And uh, I think they, they are the ones who voted against Erdogan in the municipal elections of Istanbul. They are the ones that have tried to um, uh, object to what is going on without success. And uh, I mean, these are the ones that are, are, are going to be homeless when the rest of the world turns its back to Turkey, because it will. And uh, we, we shouldn't forget this constituency in Turkey. And um, the, so as a Byzantinist, uh, will this uh, prevent a, a better study, a better communication for scholarly purposes with these monuments that are now converted into mosques? Yes, it will. Uh, will it change the face of Byzantine studies? No. Byzantine studies is much larger than these monuments. Uh, does it insult? It is a deliberate insult to the rest of the Christian world? Yes. Does it spell the end of the Christian world? No. Uh, if you study long uh, stretches of history, uh, like a number of us do on this panel, you know everything is subject to change. Uh, Father Cyril and uh, Father Dorian went through, you know, changes of, uh, of uh, orientation in religious spaces, etc. So this is one, and uh, I like to think that the monument itself will endure beyond these changes, and uh, for whomever pays attention. I'm not persuaded that everybody pays attention, and we're paying attention to it now, but we will forget about it in a little bit because of the next urgency, but uh, if uh, but there is something uh, kind of long term about the monument if you go inside. So I believe that will endure for whomever pays attention, and I stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Marudi. I, and that's very helpful, I, I think, and especially uh, your analysis of the whole thing. So now we turn to an art historian, uh, Professor Becerra Pancheva uh, from Stanford University. Hi, everyone. I wanted to start with some images, and this is what I'm doing right now. Maria, thank you very much for this very succinct um, analysis of uh, the meaning of this conversion, reconversion. And what I would like to talk today is um, the understanding of cultural heritage uh, and its two possibilities as a site of conflict or a site of reconciliation. And uh, one of the uh, journalists uh, of Turkey, a uh, member of the secular elite, wrote an article in uh, July in Le Monde uh, where she quoted Yeats and says, if we unite, the center will hold. And she's referring to a poem from 1919. So allow me to start in a poetic way. What I would like to do today is to show that Hagia Sophia, one of its greatest marvels, it's its acoustics, which is all about amplification of the human voice. It is an instrument of the human voice. And in a space that has wet acoustics, there is very little energy, human energy, that needs to be put in it, and the space will sustain and intensify. So the poetic start, when um, Eats wrote, it was 1919, and his wife had contracted uh, the yellow flu, 
uh, fortunately she survived, but he was writing the poem as uh, he was greatly concerned and it was also right after the First World War. And he, this is the beginning of the poem. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosened upon the world. The blood dimmed tide is loosened and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack, all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity." End of quote. So what we hear in this poem is anarchy, chaos, and cacophony, in which uh, a voice of reason cannot be heard. And it is about a center that doesn't hold. So my goal in today's brief intervention is to solicit, to argue for this, unite so that the center could hold. There are international organizations uh, like UNESCO, uh, like ICOMOS, and what these international organizations lack when they put sites on the World Heritage List is how to enforce when the regulations, when the conventions are not followed. There is really no mechanism to do that, and we are facing a case where a sovereignty of a country is monopolized, uh, is monopolizing the shared heritage of humanity. I would like to go now and play you a short piece that has been oralized in Hagia Sophia to introduce this experience of the wet sound of Hagia Sophia. for stopping it in the middle. Um, what I want, wanted to show you with this piece, it actually co continuously alternates between dry acoustics and the Hagia Sophia acoustics of 12 sec seconds reverberation time. And I want to use it as a metaphor, the metaphor between fragmentation and the cutting out of complexity and the complexity as reverberation, as amplification, and as the sound of interfaith. So, and I'm showing you an image right now, the interior of Hagia Sophia from the 1960s, photographed by Erich Lessing as a museum, a space where it puts to the foreground the importance of the void, this empty space under the dome of the highest dome in the Mediterranean up until the rebuilding by Bramante and Michelangelo of, of St. Peter's a space that is filled with light and a space that invites one to move through. And there is a, this space is now gone with the reconversion. Instead, what you're seeing is a fragmented space. Even the photographs, most of the photographs from the ceremony of July 24th have photographs that show the space from the east looking west. And they also show how half of this interior is gone. So from the amplified voice to the drained and dry voice um, that we see. Why is it important? Because 
part of the Byzantine function of that space, let's say not the Byzantine, I would like to speak in large terms. We have three different identities that are present in Hagia Sophia. A thousand year uh, Byzantine liturgical investment and imperial ceremonial investment in that space. Approximately 420 years uh, Ottoman ritual investment in that space connected to also sultanic ceremony and then approximately 85 years of a museum. These are three identities that the building holds together with Erich Lessing's photograph. That's an invitation of the coexistence of these three identities. With what we are seeing right now is the stripping of that complexity to one religion and the imposition of one identity and the loss in a sense of the reverberant voice of Hagia Sophia. They have, and why I say the space, the meandering through the space is so important, that is part and parcel of the concept of horos. And I am not going to give a Greek text in order to substantiate this idea, but I'll start with Mainstone, who in the 60s wrote the most important book when it comes to the understanding of the engineering of Hagia Sophia. And this is how he wrote about what the space means. This is a movement in Hagia Sophia that we no longer could entertain. It's out of the question. He says, the interior of Hagia Sophia combines the centrality of the dome with the axiality typical of a normal basilica. It is true, its true boundaries are elusive. They alternately advance and recede, sometimes solid through faced, though faced in unsubstantial looking marble, and sometimes no more than open screens. Never being fully visible at one time, they appear continuously to change as one moves around and there are ever changing partial glimpses of the peripheral space of aisles and galleries." End of quote. This is a space that is continuously seducing the visitor to move because of this concatenation of partial views that led the body to the light and led the body to explore the space. Changes in the interior were already present in the decade preceding this transformation. And I'm giving you examples from um, 2010 and 2016. In 2010, one could meander in the space. By 2016, the galleries, in the example that I'm showing you here, the floor was covered in linoleum and there are the banisters that were created, goading the visitors into a particular itinerary in that space, no longer in a sense, the meandering gaze in the space. And I would like to address some of the changes that had happened. There are right now manicure changes but they're pretty significant in terms of what, how one responds to this interior. The figural decoration, which is connected to the period after iconoclasm in Byzantium from the ninth century on, are the ones that tell the story of the significance of the site. As one enters through the narthex, one encounters this um, mosaic showing the Virgin also as an embodiment of the church, flanked by Emperor Constantine and Justinian, the one who founded the city of Constantinople and gave its name, and the uh, Justinian who built the church that we see today. Covering these mosaics covers, in a sense, that access to the traces of that thousand years of the past. The same thing is happening also um, with the mosaic over the great entrance, as well as the apse. Pierre Nora wrote about the spaces of memory, that memory needs the material shell in order to um, continue to be intense and alive in people's consciousness. This is in a sense what is removed by removing the traces of the Byzantine past in that interior and focusing on one reduced, dry understanding of what this interior should stand for. And I would like to um, end with drawing attention to the aspect of this interior decoration. So the figural mosaics are uh, covered and the floors are covered. The floors were of marble and that marble, both with its book matching, creating these wave patterns of the sea, related to the exterior, to the sea surrounding the city. 
and had a very important interconnection of playing through architecture, Genesis, the moment in which life starts with the spirit hovering over the surface of the waters. And this notion of life starting from water is also at the core of the Quran and its understanding of Genesis. These are the aspects that are now covered and their voice is lost. And I started with this notion of um, heritage as a site of conflict or heritage as a site of reconciliation. What we have seen in recent years is the use of uh, heritage sites in order to revitalize conflict, to tell a particular line of a story and to reduce the complexity of the phenomenon. And I would like to finish uh, with a quote from the same journalist I started with. She writes about her need to leave Turkey after 2016 and how this has become a society where the voice of the poet cannot be heard and how this relates to um, I'm looking uh, I'm looking for the quote itself how this relates to amplification and time. She writes, they claim, and this is uh, about AKP, the sole monopoly over the mesmerizing echo of Hagia Sophia, but the algorithm of its resonance, that incredible arithmetic of sound, belongs only to time. Such a patient matter is time. It can wait long enough for those who do not know any other language that shouting than shouting to eventually lose their voices." End of quote. And I'll finish with the hope that if humanity unites, the center would hold. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bencheva. Uh, and I wanted to thank you especially for the audio and video uh, which which made it come alive for us in a real sense, uh, rather than just talking about it. So I, that was very effective for you to do that. Uh, our final panelist is uh, Professor Ali de Koglu from uh, Stanford University, uh, who will talk about it from the perspective of his study of Ottoman and Turkish history. So, uh, Professor Yakoglu. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me uh, to this panel. Um, so I prepared a text, but, uh, you know, just listening, um, the other panelists, um, I think I need, I need to, you know, reshuffle what I need to say. So the question is why then, you know, Maria, I think mentioned that 70% of Turkish population, uh, agreed with the decision, right? So the question is why? why, why, you know, there's this tremendous support to, the, to that decision. Um, it's, it's puzzling, isn't it? I mean, 70% of Turkey, you know, I mean, they don't vote for Erdogan, but they for this conversion. Um, so last couple of months, I um, studied uh, this uh, symbolism of Ayasofya in from 1950s on, in the 1930s on, and I would like to share some of my findings uh, to why Ayasofya became so like controversial and important throughout the Republican period in Turkey. So I, I right now I don't I, I will not talk about the Ottoman Ayasofya that we can talk later if Q and A if you would like to. Um, go uh, that direction and then, you know, I, I have lots of, you know, um, say lots of things to say about, talk about the Ottoman Hagia Sophia. But in 1934, this, this decision of, you know, turning uh, the building into a mosque was a very radical decision in many ways. I mean, this is, you know, Hagia Sophia was the most important building of the Ottoman Empire with the Kabe and with Dome of the Rock. So why this, this decision was made? Is it secularism? Yes, it is about secularism, but it's more than secularism. It's also a kind of a manifestation, or if you like a demystification of the Ottoman narrative. You know, it is a rejection of the Ottoman, Ottoman spiritual politics, if you like, and the new engagement with the past. 
uh, the Turkey's past, the you know the past of Anatoly. It doesn't mean that this early Republican regime was like embracing all these national groups and you know ethnicities and cultures, what not. Not at all. It was a Turkish nationalist government, but at the same time they want to create a new relationship with the past, with the memory, uh, create a new memory, if you like. So it was not just a, a mimic or a kind of a message to the to the Christianity or to the world or to the America. It was really very much like um, part of its internal politics and internal, you know, a reconfiguration of uh, of 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 um, what what Turkish past was. Um, when this decision was made in 1934, I, I just find out in different uh, newspapers, uh, there was some you know, doubts from different circles, uh, but even some seculars, uh, secular intellectuals said, well, I mean, this building is a spiritual building and museum, if you turn into a museum, it will lose its like spirituality. So uh, for instance, a journalist said, I kind of he proposed, why don't we make a museum but keep it as a mosque at the same time? So it, in 1934, 35, there was some you know interesting discussions among not not, not you know not from the Islamists but even among the secular uh, Republican elite. There was a kind of um, um, a debate about this uh, this 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 decision. And it was, you know, it, well, it turned out to be a mosque, a, a church, a museum. And then there was a very interesting history in the early like stage, um, this museumization of, of the of the building. So 1940, late 1940s onwards, we see a kind of a new, if you like, a right wing discourse. Maybe right wing, maybe not the right term for that time, but the kind of a discourse criticizing the Republic in general, a revisionist discourse, if you like, um, and particularly critical to this draconian re like reforms of the early Republic of 1930s. Uh, in that, you know, that basically the argument is the reforms, the secular reforms or Republican reforms were top, top, top down. They were radical. They didn't, uh, they're not democratic. And they didn't really ask what people like to have in Turkey. You know, no, there was no referendum. There was no like a kind of a participation. So all of a sudden, Hagia Sophia became the symbol of this critique of the Republic or Republicanism in Turkey, including secular uh, reforms. So Hagia Sophia was seen as a kind of a part of this top-down, secular, authoritarian, single party system. You know, it's their decision and uh, it, it really hurts the pious Muslims. Uh, it didn't really take care of this memory and emotions of the, of the Muslims. For them, this building was the most important religious building. Uh, for centuries, uh, spiritual building. So, uh, and it was also a kind of a self-colonization, they, you know, uh, in a way, uh, on the part of the founders of modern Turkey. I mean, they, 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 they really, according to this, this right-wing authors, they said, well, I mean, they, um, they mimicked, you know, the, the Western uh, uh, ideas to create a kind of a, a, a spiritual building into a museum, it was in, in, in a way self-colonization. So what is interesting here, uh, the uh, Sophie became a kind of a symbol of victimhood. And this is, you know, the Muslims were the victim of this top-down reforms, this authoritarian regimes. And uh, so there's this like discourse of victimhood. It's very, very interesting. But then, more or less at the same time, there's another kind of discourse was emerging, surfacing, which is which seems to be controversial. I mean, uh, contradicting. Isofia is also the building, the mosque. I mean, the the building of the conquest, and it is the building of the you know the Muslim Islamic triumph, uh, and so. Even like it is a building, according to one famous poem, 
uh, written by this famous conservative poet, he said, well, in fact, God destined Hagia Sophia to be the mosque. It was, this decision was given even this building was built before, you know, and the build, building was built before Muhammad, right? So it was a pre-Islamic building. So it is destined, it's a cosmological alchemy that this building became the mosque. So, um, and it is like, and it's conversion to a mosque in a way is ending the corruption, hypocrisy, backwardness of the Byzantine empire. So this is the language, like Byzantine empire is associated with hypocrisy, corruption, um, and um, backwardness. And the Islamic conquest is a progress, it's enlightenment, it's freedom, even the use, they use the term freedom. So what we have here in 1940s, 60s, 50s, 60s, these two discourse are coming together. On the one hand, it's a victimhood, you know, Ayasofya is a symbol of the victimhood of the pious Muslims. On the other hand, it is a symbol of Islamic triumphalism, even like Islamic supremacy or Muslim supremacy. Um, so this is amazing for a right-wing politician, right? I mean, you have two things at the same time in one, you know, in one plate, you can play for the victimhood and you can play for uh, supremacy. So 1950s onwards, uh, and especially from the 1965 on, right-wing politicians played this card, the Ayasofya card. They said, well, we'll change, we'll turn this mu museum into the mosque and, and this uh, suppression. They use the term suppression and this, you know, zulm. And, uh, but they didn't do that until Erdogan did. Because as a card, it's very useful. I mean, the Turkish politicians, they use it, but ne they never played this card, right? Um, well, Ayasofya at the same time, one of the most lucrative buildings for Minister of Culture, right? I mean, it was the most important tourist destination. Um, there was, in Minister of Culture, there was a group of archeologists, you know, who are really into this, uh, uh, so in, within the state, in fact, that was very much uh, an opposition. That would be an opposition if this decision was made in 1960s, 40s, uh, 70s, or even 80s. Um, so why now? Well, I, I totally agree with Maria. I mean, this is, uh, Erdogan is losing popularity. Uh, the Turkish economy is falling apart. COVID situation is getting worse and worse. And he wanted to play with this card and he wants to play with it and he wants to, you know, cash it in, in, in a way. The problem is it didn't work. I mean, eventually uh, Sofia was obviously, it, it, you know, uh, it's in our mosque, but this, what Erdogan hoped didn't happen. So there was no reaction from the opposition. I mean, yes, in Turkey, there was a, some opposition from different academic circles and intellectuals, but there's no party, you know, no party, no political party, including Republican party didn't oppose this decision. And the idea is that, you know, this decision is to foster polarization and they said they don't want to play this game, for, you know, and this, if they oppose it, it this would um, foster Erdogan's kind of intentions. Um, so at the end of that, there was no reaction. Uh, there was no opposition, there was no protest from any political party in Turkey. Uh, even one of the members, key members of the opposition party went to the, you know, the Friday prayer. So during that period, we see also kind of an internationalization of ISOF. Yeah, there's this new Minister of Communication Affairs, Minister of Communication Affairs, it was just built set up under Erdogan, they started to sponsor different music um, clips uh, through YouTube, you know, uh, in different languages uh, that Muslim, Muslim people speak, you know, a kind of a, um, a, 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 a song was composed for Hagia Sophia. It started in Turkish, it continued with Arabic and then Persian and then Urdu and then Malay, you know, like, so they tried to make Hagia Sophia an international, uh, Mus like Islamic uh, um, rhetoric, but it didn't work either. 
I mean, that was very interesting opposition from some Arab countries. This was very interesting. Maybe Erdogan liked it because he liked any kind of provocation. I mean, any kind of opposition because he wants to provoke these oppositions. But eventually he didn't get what he wanted. I mean, this is, this is for sure. There's another discussion uh, about also Karie uh, Mosque or Hora Mosque. Uh, the legal element of it. I mean, the the uh, ministry of the sorry, the court, the Council of State actually uh, referred the Waqf law, the you know Islamic law, when they they give decision. This is very interesting. So according to the decision, Islam, you know, uh, this is a Waqf. This is a waqf, Sultanic Waqf, a Waqf of Muhammad the Conqueror. So the min the decision in 1934 uh, is was illegal. So this is very interesting. This is a big deal. Uh, this is a big deal. There's a kind of com, you know uh, discussion. I even wrote about that in a in a um, in a newspaper. So I don't know what, whether it's it is just a part of a larger plan uh, of a larger legal uh, like transition to Islamic law, civil law, or is it just a, they want to open a hole in the system and. Uh, it's not very clear, but this is this is very interesting. And last of all, everything here uh, is very much like pragmatic politics. I mean, inter both international and uh, domestic. But there is also very much like a, this interesting language, as also Maria a little bit mentioned, uh, this eschatological language. It's very interesting, you know. And also the Tayyip Erdogan's name, Tayyip, coming from Quran as well, like Baldetun Tayyibatun, literally means a fair land, referred to Istanbul according to you know, Muslim um, uh, exigencies, uh, and Ottoman exigencies of Quran, actually. This is the, you know, the passage uh, 34 or 15. So according to some Muslims, even Tayyip Erdogan's coming to power is Prof, you know, it is in the Quran. So it's a prophecy. So this is a part of this prophecy, this, this conversion of the mosque is the part of this, the conclusion of this larger kind of um, godly destined, uh, you know, uh, this cosmological event. So that was this kind of very interesting uh, discussion in different popular circles uh, in Turkey and uh, and then, you know, I mean, to what extent it is really, a, you know, part of uh, authoritarianism, to what extent it is a part of more a kind of a Islamic conservative nationalist discourse coming from 1940s, 50s, to what extent it is international, uh, international politics, you know, all of them were intermingled. Uh, and and I, I, let me stop here. Um, just one, um, in the long run, in the, I don't think that, you know, there's a, there, this, you know, uh, this decision would be reversed. I mean, there, I don't see any possibility that, you know, Ayasopia would be a, mosque, a museum again in the, in the, you know, even in the long run, I don't, I don't see that possibility. It's very difficult. Uh, it's like, it's very emotionally charged, politically charged, religiously charged. I mean, this is, you know. So what I, uh, with, with my wife, uh, we wrote a uh, piece and we basically, uh, my wife is an art historian, Islamic art historian, we propose a kind of possibility, not a like a museum, but a kind of a mosque museum. Is it possible to, you know, intervene this building, um, and um, and at least you know do something um, better, uh, even though we cannot change the status uh, as as a as a mosque. It's very sad. I I totally share my heart, you know, and I totally share Bissera's um, uh, position and uh, frustration, sadness. Um, but at the same time, it, it was a, yeah, I mean, I don't think that it is possible in the near future that, you know, it will, it will be a uh, museum again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jakoglu. Uh, we have 
we're getting a little bit short on time. I would like to suggest that we go to a quarter of nine, if that's agreeable. Uh, we'll take about 20 minutes to ask uh, our panelists if they would like to respond uh, briefly uh, to one of the speakers. So you might raise your hand and uh, I'll call on you and then you can respond uh, in any way you want to one of the speakers. But because we would like to bring some of those who are in the uh, uh, audience, our participants today, in to bring their questions in. So we'll try to keep this to about uh, 20 minutes uh, strictly. Is that, is that agreeable? Yes, it is. Okay. Professor Pancheva. So uh, Ali brought up a very important issue that uh, the museum was visited by over 3 million people a year mm -hmm. and uh, foreign visitors paid approximately 10 euro uh, as a ticket and that was a significant revenue. And in addition, there was a support also from the Ministry of Culture. Uh, what is really um, an uncharted territory is that with the change of jurisdiction, who will assume the stewardship of the monument and to what extent this will be professional care that has a focus on historical value of the building rather than use value. So instead of a presentist model to really think about the layers of history that are in this building. And this is a complete um, um, silence that we have from Turkey, even trying to connect to scholars who are in Turkey, they're afraid to talk about, and, they, uh, and some of them don't know. And this is um, a very dangerous silence because the issue of the conservation of the monument is the most important one. And we don't know neither what the funding will be, nor who will be in charge, nor to what extent the projects that were underway will be continued. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, is there another comment? Anybody else want to respond? Can I say something to what Bissari just said? Uh, yes. As far as I know, yeah, it is under the jurisdiction of the Re Director of Religious Affairs at the moment, which is not good uh, by all means. Um, and they don't have any know-how, any kind of background and, you know, dealing with such a, mo such a monument. Uh, and this is the most concerning part, actually. Uh, so this is why, in fact, um, uh, we need to find ways to convince, you know, when we say we, I mean, different, different groups, and uh, we, also in Turkey, that Ministry of Culture still be part of the process and part of the building jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, maybe a kind of hybrid model was possible. But the di director of religious affairs is getting extremely powerful in Turkey. Uh, it's the biggest institution right now. It's very weird uh, what's going on, uh, you know. Uh, and, and recently, uh, the, the first, first, actually the first um, uh, hutbah, uh, was read by, uh, was given by this, uh, the, the chief of the director with this, with a sword, which created a kind of very interesting controversy. So this sword uh, is really a kind of a claim of the, to the building. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, another comment from, yes, uh, Professor Marudi. So if I may be a Cassandra, I do not think I think if, because if you look at what happened to other Byzantine monuments that were turned into mosques and other uses, etc., and there are examples that Byzantinists know well about, uh, there's going to be intervention to the building that is not going to be about preservation. It will destroy information. It, this will happen. I am sure it will. And uh, that's why what has already been done uh, in terms of recording the building uh, is going to be magnified in importance a hundredfold. Totally. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mabrudi. Uh, Father Cyril. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, I was fascinated by what Professor um, Yejoglu said about the prophecies about Erdogan in, in the Quran and uh, how they uh, build uh, a new hermeneutics 
uh, of the holy texts on the basis of their current policies. And I think it's, uh, there is another parallel with that. I mentioned already uh, that uh, what Erdogan does to Islam is similar to what Trump does probably to, uh, to the evangelical Christianity and what Mr. Putin does to the Orthodox Christianity because they try to capitalize and to increase to boost their legitimacy by appealing to kind of popular uh, feelings of their religious constituencies, as it were. And it's, it reminded me how Mr. Putin uh, utilized, you know, the, uh, the story of baptism of Rus, uh, mm -hmm. but because he has the same name with the baptizer of Rus, Vladimir, him and Saint Vladimir who baptized Rus, and he built a huge monument just in front, he installed this huge monument in front of the Kremlin in order to kind of uh, visualize his mm -hmm. mission as a second baptizer, the second Vladimir the Great, uh, so there are so many parallels, interesting parallels between the modern populists who try to capitalize on, on the religious feelings. Uh, thank you, Father Cyril. Uh, anyone else from, uh, from our panel? Yeah, Professor Pancheva. I would like to um, answer to the extent uh, possible one of uh, uh, both Ali and Maria's questions of why there is such a high percentage of approval or at least uh, um, not engaging in uh, conflict after this decision is taken within Turkey. And I think to a very great extent, uh, the character of an authoritarian regime is that there is one identity that the state supports and everyone else is an outsider. And if you raise your voice, you'll be kicked out. Mm -hmm. And the fear in a sense, silence is that fear of speaking up and um, it, what um, uh, was said is absolutely true, that the greatest losers of this um, transformation is the secular um, um, elite uh, and the notion of uh, Turkey as a secular representative um, democracy. And I want to give one example. This is not Hagia Sophia, but this is something probably Ali could also address the change of the landscape of uh, Istanbul with the building of the Jamlija Mosque, this mammoth that is on the other side, on the Asian side of Istanbul, already proclaims, in a sense, Sunni identity as the one identity that will be considered legitimate and nothing else. And so the problem is so much deeper, um, in a sense, and this also relates to Hagia Sophia's reconversion is a distraction destruction as cheaply in a sense organized that is connected to a series of other issues that are not touched upon and one of them for instance is also the oil drilling in the eastern mediterranean so variety in a sense of um, aspects our forum is about hagia sophia but we all realize and understand that it is a facade a facade behind which a fascist type of a reg regime had established itself. And it is one, in a sense, of many um, mushrooming examples, which make the connection, in a sense, uh, to post-World War I Europe even more haunting. Thank you, Thank you for that, uh, Professor Bencheva. Any other comments from the members of the panel? Father Dorian. I'm sorry, I've got a horrible noise going on in the background, which I'm trying to stop. Um, okay. um, yeah, I, I, it's, I'm in a situation where something has happened which, with, which, when, with, when, which we radically disagree with, um, it's always interesting trying, to get, interesting to trying to get inside the head of the people who hold, who hold the, the opposing view. So I, I guess what I'm trying, struggling to understand really, I mean, I can understand from the point of view of the, 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 the politics of uh, Erdogan himself, uh, why this decision was taken. But I'm wondering for those, if that, if that figure is correct, that there are some, there's a 70% 70, 70 approval for this. Mm -hmm. um, it, to, to my mind, I think I understand a little bit about the, a little bit better now, having listened to you um, about the background to this, but um, it seems to me that there must be some deep, uh, sort of almost unexpressed hurt, anger, frustration, uh, uh, which is being addressed through the reconversion of the mosque. Uh, 
Uh, Professor Yaklogu, you want to respond to that? <laughs> uh, I, I think there's 70%. Uh, so the, the approval rate of Erdogan today is around, last polls show, 45%. And and um, forty to forty five percent. Yet the approval rate for the this this decision was seventy percent or 75 percent. So it seems that it is more than authoritarianism. Uh, so there's something going on here. Uh, and um, and. I mean, authoritarianism is important. I agree with Bissara. Uh, definitely, uh, people don't want to say much. Uh, they couldn't. They are afraid. Uh, the opposition parties didn't mobilize the people, right? Because they don't want to play this this game. Uh, but still, uh, there's there's something going on, and I think um, there are two. There might be two possibilities. One is this all propaganda, all this like. The, um, this movement, the Ayasofya movement, if you like, from 1950s on, that Ayasofya became the symbol of this top-down authoritarian secularism, whether it, it convinced many people, or maybe it's right, maybe this is the case. Uh, I don't know the answer. I mean, I don't think, author, you know, secular, the, you know, the early Republic uh, was, I mean, it was authoritarian, but when I look at 1930s, I didn't see a major opposition to this conversion of the, of the church into the into the Muslim. So it seems that 1950s onwards, this um, and this whole like Cold War crises, you know, um, Turkish right, uh, especially conservative right, nationalists. Islamists. I mean, they all agree with this Ayasofya thing, and they don't agree with other things. They agree with Ayasofya. Uh, Hagia Sophia's, you know, conversion was wrong. This is what they agree with. So it seems that, um, uh, again, I mean, I think my, um, what I said about this, this, you know, this interesting marriage between this victimhood and triumphalism, you know, is extremely useful. And it convinced many people, you know, I mean, you, if you're really a Muslim and you like this, this triumphal language, you know, of this great conquest, but also victimhood is very attractive for uh, for uh, for many people, especially when we think about the whole like the crisis over crisis, crisis over crisis, the Turkish history in the in the Cold War, you know. That was uh, the substance of Dorian's question. Yeah, can I? I think we I should also uh, attempt an answer from an unqualified kind of my unqualified certainly much less qualified than Professor Yaijiolu's opinion. But uh, I think the, uh, the high approval rate also speaks to hurt Turkish pride from the beginning of the 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Turks lost a big empire. Mm -hmm. You don't get over that within the space of a hundred years. It's impossible. Yeah. I mean, uh, the Greeks have not gone over, <laughs> over that <laughs> for longer. So it's... Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, that, I think that's, it's, it's not just Islam, it's also the nostalgia for an empire. I want to bring to Professor Gyadjivlu's attention um, uh, something I read uh, very recently, uh, which is my colleague Christine Filiu's new book on uh, a, a very well-known Turkish satirist, uh, Refik Halit, uh, known as Karay. And uh, in reading her book, I realized that he mentioned jokingly that, he, the, that the nationalists, like Kemal Atatürk, not the nationalists, Kemal Atatürk, the Kemalists are discussing the demolition of Hagia Sophia uh, before the 30s. I forget exactly which date it was, but it was the interim period between the, be, at, while Kemal was consolidating his power. So mm -hmm. this idea of, of uh, Hagia Sophia as this symbol of uh, secularism, etc., that is to man be manipulated in this struggle for consolidation, post-Ottoman consolidation of power. Is, is a, it appears to me, unqualified opinion, as I said, is there from, from point one, as soon as the Sultanate, as soon as the empire is dissolved. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I um, want to interrupt at this point. I want to give the uh, people who have joined us uh, a chance to have their questions addressed. So if, you, if the panel doesn't mind, uh, I'd like to turn to those, those questions. Uh, the first one <clears throat> concerns the uh, icons. Uh, will the mosaics remain on view after the conversion? Would somebody like to speak to that? Father Cyril. Yeah, I responded briefly in the chat that, uh, yes, the original plan, I think, was to uh, keep, keep them covered by curtains uh, during the pray prayer. And I think they, they uh, keep them covered beyond the prayer. So you can, you don't expect to see them all, both in, in Ahia Sophia and Karia uh, mm. or Hora Monastery. Uh, yeah, at the moment, uh, they didn't split up the curtains. They just keep it all the time. Uh, thank you. Uh, here's a second question. The Turkish authorities promised that they would cover the images only for the time of prayer. However, as far as I heard, they keep them covered all the time. Well, that was that, my response, yeah. That was your response, exactly, yeah. Uh, another question. To what extent has the U.S. pulling back from its prior status as a significant international power broker in the Eastern Mediterranean enabled Erdogan to pursue his goal of a neo-Ottoman empire that includes the symbolic reconversion of the Kora and the Hagia Sophia into Basques? That's a rather uh, political question, uh, but I, I will leave it to uh, whoever would like to, to address that. I, uh, I can say a few things. I, I, um, I don't, you know, I mean, I don't think he's, um, he's as powerful to create a kind of an empire. I mean, I, I, I don't see that. Uh, the empire nostalgia is there. It's very strong. It's just, you know, I mean, with, in popular culture, in like every, we have a new movie just started actually uh, about not this time the Selchuks, by the way, as, <laughs> not the Ottomans, but over and over this history became a kind of um, commodity for politics and uh, and um, but this neo Ottomanism, I mean, I, I that was this debate. I don't see that this is a you know. Um, uh, that Erdogan has this international, uh, I mean, Erdogan and Turkey doesn't have that power to create a kind of empire in Eastern Mediterranean. I mean, they tried to do some, you know, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean with this new, you know, conflict with Greece or, you know, they were involved in Azerbaijan. They're, you know, they're aggressive, uh, but, you know, and uh, you know, American withdrawal obviously is important. Yes, uh, everybody is now more aggressive than than before, I, because America was not aggressive. Uh, so yeah, but I don't see um, that you know uh, this neo-Ottomanism is, is is a kind of a feasible international project for Turkey. I don't I don't see that. Good, thank you. Here's another one. Thanks to uh, Professor Marvudi. I think your analysis is right on about Erdogan positioning himself as the champion of Sunni Islam. The Quran chapter is Surah Al-Rum, chapter 30. And I didn't realize that it was being used in the current situation. I'm supposed to say something. I don't know. Well, <laughs> I have nothing to say. <laughs> actually, it's, it's uh, applauding your, your analysis, I think. Thank you. If someone else would like to uh, address that briefly. Well, maybe we could go on to the next one then. Uh, and this is a, an important one, I think. Will the reconversion into an active mosque in any way impede the ongoing engineering work to strengthen the Hagia Sophia against earthquakes and the building's prior structural weaknesses? In other words, is the engineering work going on to uh, you know, preserve the integrity of the building? I think this is part and parcel of what we have. 
I would like to speak, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm muted or not. Am I muted? No, no, we good. Good. You're Very well. I think this is part and parcel of the lack of information. Our channels of communication with people who are in, were involved with the conservation of Hagia Sophia are broken. And we, it's a question that cannot be answered right now. The most recent information about uh, a UNESCO report is from 2014. So in a sense, it is this silence that is very perturbing. I had something I wanted to say after Maria's uh, comment, and uh, it has to do with the change of the um, minorities in Turkey and especially in Istanbul, that the moment in which Hagia Sophia became a museum in 1934, there is really a vast Christian community, um, Armenians, Greeks, and uh, there is also a very important Jewish community in the city. And um, the Muslim population actually is not very big. This is completely reversed when we look in the 21st century. It's just a couple of thousand Christians that have remained. And it is significant that some of the changes in the rhetoric about Hagia Sophia that uh, Ali drew our attention to in the 1950s also coincide with uh, some of the beatings of Christians that took place in 1955 and then the eventual um, emigration of large swaths of this population. So in a sense, there is certain homogeneity that had appeared that was not there in 1934. And the Christian constituencies are afraid to raise their voice. Um, and there is very little political representation of their voice as well. So it is the, the transformation from diversity Mm -hmm. to um, this much more homogenous um, uh, population that uh, we also need to take into consideration. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Era. One, one, the other question, which I think is an important one, in, in light of the ongoing refugee crisis and the role of Turkey in technically pushing refugees into the EU, do you see more tensions evolving in the reception of Muslim refugees in Europe and the overall rise of European nationalism? Yeah, may, may I briefly react to this? I think the, the, the most, the largest body of the refugees who come from Turkey to the EU, they go through Greece. So Greece, which feels quite insulted by, by this step. So it's, it's really a, a, a sort of a, an unhelpful um, uh, step also in terms of reception of the refugees. At the same time, I think <clears throat> the refugees has, have become, uh, um, um, uh, you know, a, a, a token of exchange with the EU. Erdogan threatens the EU right. with sending more refugees to Europe. So it's mm -hmm. another kind of instrumentalization of a tragedy, of a catastrophe uh, for, to, mm -hmm. to, to, to the political ends. Mm -hmm. I think if I may ad address that, and then partly going back to, to um, Professor Bencheva's comment, really, because um, the question of the population and the homo religious homo homogeneity of the, is really significant. It's really, I mean, what I mentioned is that, you know, I think one of the, um, it's this, the thing with in uh, Cordoba, you know, the, the Mezquita there is, um, you know, Spain has a growing Muslim population. And um, but, and it also is, uh, has been historically Muslim country, particularly in the South. Uh, and yet the fact that there is a lived population there uh, of, of sufficiently practicing Catholics means that the claims to, you know, they were taken to the Spanish high court um, to, um, for the Mezquita to become a secular building or to, or from, or to be handed over to, um, to be used as a mosque again. Uh, they, did, they didn't go very, very far. Uh, but there is something I think there is there about the fact that it's no what you you very usefully said, Professor Pinchev, about you know the the particularly social context uh, of of 1934 as opposed to 2020. I mean that's to my mind that's hugely significant. And I think one of the problems here is actually how to deal well. I mean religious homogeneity causes its own problems as well as religious diversity. You know uh, different set, sets of problems, but. Um, at a point when, um, if you put together an increased uh, religious uh, homogeneity, plus the kind of I want to call the memory of the sh the shame of losing an empire, you know, um, the, the historical things, 
that's a pretty potent uh, mix there. So it's almost, to some ways, there's a certainly never, not, not a great surprise that this actually happened when one begins to know more about the, uh, about, about the context. Um, the, the point that has been worried me all along as I've, as I've listened to this is actually, it's actually to go back to Professor Pencheb is that the question of um, what is it to be uh, for a building to be the patrimony of humanity? I mean, how, who, who gets to decide that? And if that is the case, then what is the role, the, the relative autonomy, um, what is the autonomy of a state to do uh, what they do, what they did with an ancient monument? So who is responsible, for example, for the, if we declare for the, for the, um, for the pyramids? Because financially, you know, I mean, Egypt has to look after the pyramids. It does get international help, but there is a sense in which, um, the, the kind of the the UNESCO thing, the declaration of that this is part of the common patrimony of humanity, of humanity, I think is helpful, but it actually really points to the point about there is no authority internationally strong enough to be able to uh, to shape these things, and so it has to be done by negotiation. Um, to go back to point with sort of, and, and I don't know what the body. Or the, or the bodies who would be strong enough to reverse this decision. I don't know what, what they could be. Can I, can I say something? Yes. Uh, you know, when I listened to this um, interview with people who just entered the building when it just turned into a mosque, yeah. uh, it was very interesting. I mean, many people said, well, at the end, we now, this building belongs to us again. As if they, it didn't. I mean, it was a museum, right? It was a museum. It was under Turkish government. You know, it's a Tur you know, in Turkey, and people can go and visit freely. Actually, I mean, only the foreign people can pay. You know, if you have a museum, like a museum card, it's free for every Turkish citizen. Still, people th thought that well, it didn't belong to them, but it was a museum. So what is it? I mean, this is really striking. I just asked myself, I mean, why they thought that, I mean, I understand, okay, for religious reason, you might like to see this building as a mosque. That's fine, fine. We can discuss that, we can agree or disagree. But just feeling that this building didn't belong to them when it was museum, it was a museum, this was pretty striking. I mean, we have to ask this question, I guess. Why uh, a museum uh, didn't give this feeling to those people that you know they think that they're they're not part of this this project, uh, and also um, I, I as a museum, um, so you know as an Ottoman historian, um, there's some you know when the whole discussion is very much like, you know, mo mosque versus church, right? Mosque and church, and this. I mean, uh, obviously you know for me it is just. You know, I'm not a religious person, so I don't think I don't embrace this building as a religious monument. I love this building, but just as a, as a, as, as the building, and it's all multi-layered history. For me, it is it has lots of histories, and I love all the histories. Um, so this multiple this this pluralism in this past is striking, right? As a museum, it didn't give this impression. Uh, also, this is my you know I I mean I so I also curious about. Bissara said, can, you know, how would you uh, respond to that? I mean, I understand, you know, I like the way that you, you, this is the empty space and this museum is inviting, but at the same time, you know, thinking about all this, you know, documents produced, you know, during, about Ayasofya during, it was a museum, it, it didn't really embrace all this multi-layered history, right? I mean, it was very strange. It was almost like a silent building. Mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't speak to the building. It was a building which was pretty, you know, um, yeah, I mean, uh, shy or even not shy, just maybe, um, d what, silent, right? I mean, so um, this was this the, so the, when people say that when it was a museum, it's not, it didn't belong to us. I mean, there's some interesting thing there uh, that we have to think, I suppose. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Pancheva, uh, and, and we're getting very close to the end. So let me just remind you of that. I would like to respond to, a little bit to the question that um, Dorian Levelin um, asked. It is about, is there an international mechanism 
And this is the bigger issue that uh, UNESCO um, does not have any mechanisms to exercise um, um, control uh, in a sense when a state party is shown to be in direct violation of the conventions. There is no effective mechanism to hold it accountable, much less impose a penalty or reverse the conflict. And there is a very important book on the history of UNESCO written by Lynn Mesco that came out in 2018. It's called A Future in Ruins, UNESCO World Heritage and the Dream of Peace. And this book basically shows how archaeologists were cut out very early on in the process of the formation of UNESCO. And from the late 60s on, they didn't have a voice. So in a sense, if the mission of UNESCO was about conservation, it completely changed. So in a sense, getting your monument included in the history, in the list of uh, historic monuments is more of a cash cow of making money, something that is connected with tourism and the economy and less concern about the conservation of the monument, which also comes in a vacuum that there is no mechanism to impose conservation and to control how the conservation is done. So it is a very fraught issue um, uh, that we are facing. And very quickly to Ali, I would be very curious to know how the study of history in elementary, middle and high school in Turkey has been changing. Because the fact that people di didn't feel the building belonged to them is also showing the way history is taught had not succeeded in its mission about multi-ethnic Turkey, for instance. Um, I'm not saying it as, a, as, as, an, as an aggressive uh, gesture, not at all. I'm just saying that it's also a failure of how one teaches history. Um, I want to recommend one book that uh, uh, our professor Amir Hussein has uh, brought to our attention, <clears throat> which is related to, uh, I think, what uh, Professor Bencheva just said. It's uh, Christine M. Pilulu, H-I-L-L-I-O-U, and it's entitled Turkey, A Past Against History. A P Turkey, A Past Against History. That's one more. This is the book of my colleague that I mentioned earlier. Okay, good. Very good. <laughs> I want to ask a final question, taking my uh, point of privilege as, as the moderator. We haven't addressed the interreligious question. And I would like to ask uh, any of you that would like to respond to this, with, with the ongoing um, often hostile relations between Muslims and Christians with the need for interreligious dialogue, uh, is this move on the part of uh, the, uh, Turkey and Erdogan, is, is there any way that this is going to uh, help interreligious relationships or is it going to be an obstacle? Uh, and However, we answer that. How do we encourage uh, the kind of interreligious uh, conversation where we learn to respect each other and become uh, uh, friends of each other, begin to appreciate each other's religious traditions? Uh, does the conversion of the museum into a mosque have any kind of um, interreligious impact? Um, Tom, if I may jump into that. Um, that would depend where you are, um, in, because interreligious relations are always local. Um, so um, is it going to make any difference in Springfield, Illinois? Absolutely not. Um, will it make a difference in, in certain parts of the Middle East and Eastern Europe? I, uh, it's more likely to do so there. Um, one thing I would say that also, you talk about interreligious dialogue. Um, I'd rather use the word interreligious encounter because I think generally in terms of our interreligious relations is far too much talking and not enough shared action. Um, I think what I would, would, so it's a question again, I just want to repeat myself of, you know, think global, but act local. Um, and the more that we act together on things that we actually can agree with, I think the more harmonious will the relations will be um, and that more we can be, can, and it's out of those, those relations that I think we can build trust where we can deal with the really difficult questions. 
thank you very much, Dorian. That, that's very helpful. Uh, does anybody else want to weigh in on that? I may add uh, a few words to that. I completely agree with Father, Father Dorian. And uh, my question is that as far as, as we can see, uh, these uh, political steps by the Turkish government, uh, they do not help very much the interreligious dialogue, dialogue. However, the interreligious dialogue or dialogues, and I agree that there are many of them and most of them are local, um, they may help to address all those issues that we've discussed today. Uh, so the interreligious dialogue should be a leading force in kind of addressing those issues. Um, so there are expectations about the dialogue. Good. Uh, thank you, Father Cyril, uh, very much. Um, I think we've come to the end of our, our time. I want to begin by thanking uh, all of our panelists uh, for your very important in, uh, input uh, for the conversation that we've had for some of the difficult questions we've, we've wrestled with uh, in this evening. Uh, political, artistic, architectural, uh, religious, uh, there, there's really has raised a great many questions. And we want to thank especially uh, Christina uh, for organizing this conversation and for calling this uh, distinguished group together. So, uh, Christina, we, we, we thank you for that and, and applaud you for this initiative. Well, thank so, you very much, everyone, for participating uh, and everyone who has attended the uh, discussion panel. Thank you so much. Okay. So, I think we'll draw this evening to a close and thank you all very much and uh, success in your ongoing work. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night Thank to you. you.